Hello, this is Aaron Mandel, and this is the American Wine Society's continuing series on the wines of France. Today, our presentation is going to be about the wines of the Rhone. We want to thank our uh, generous Crew 100 donors for their support of AWS programming uh, that allows us to put together our videos as well as our uh, PowerPoints. Uh, we have a list of some of our Crew 100 donors here. We want to thank them very much for making this all possible. If you watched our PowerPoint on the Burgundy wine region, then you know that the Burgundy wine region is located a little to the east of central uh, France, and that you have Burgundy, and in the south of that you have Beaujolais. If you continue to the south, you end up in the Rhone Valley. The Rhone is located south of Beaujolais and to the north of Languedoc-Roussillon. Uh, we often refer to the Rhone wine region as the Rhone or the Rhone Valley, but really it's best to think about the northern and southern Rhone as two distinct wine regions. Just to give you an idea about where the Rhone is located in uh, comparison with the latitude in the United States, we're talking about 4507 for Hermitage. Uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis is 44.98. So Hermitage is actually a little bit further north latitude than Minneapolis, Minnesota. But because of the different uh, effects we have of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and the terrain located in the Rhone, we end up with a completely different growing region than we would if we were trying to plant grapes in Minneapolis. First, let's talk about the northern Rhone. The northern Rhone stretches from Cote Roti in the north to saint pere in the south. It's primarily a land of red wines, but also produces some excellent white wines. When we talk about the Rhone, one of the reasons we want to talk about the northern Rhone and southern Rhone separately is the grapes. When you get a red wine from the northern Rhone, it's going to be Syrah. Syrah is the same grape you think of when you hear about an Australian Shiraz. Sometimes you'll see Syrah or Shiraz on a label, depending upon whether they're trying to make it in the Australian style or the Rhone style. But Syrah and Shiraz are the same grape. In Syrah, you can get a lot of black fruit, blackberry, black cherry, uh, blueberry. You're going to get a meaty characteristic. I often get bacon in Syrah from the Northern Rhone. There's gonna be some spice characteristics quite often black pepper. In the white wines in the Northern Rhone, you're really talking about Viognier from a few regions, Marsan and Rousson. Viognier is a very aromatic grape. I often joke that I just wanna sit with it in the corner and smell it uh, because it just has this very aromatic profile of apricots and peach, maybe a little bit of honey characteristics but it's a very dry wine. Viognier, despite its very aromatic profile, is very dry. The way that Viognier ripens, it takes a long time to get that aromatic profile. So during that time that it's ripening, you get a lot of sugars growing, I mean, being created in the grapes. So Viognier can also tend to have a little bit more alcohol, 13 and a half, maybe even 14% because you really have ultra ripe grapes by the time you get that aromatic profile. But it's an excellent, well-balanced um, wine, especially when you're dealing with uh, areas like Condru. Marsan and Roussan are usually blended. Marsan can be very heavy bodied, lighter acidity it can tend to be a little bit of flab uh, because you don't have enough acidity to really balance out the, the body and the alcohol in there. But Roussan has a high acidity, can have a lot of citrus characteristics, uh, a little bit of um, uh, honeysuckle in there. So the Marsan and Roussan are normally blended. The Roussan gives the Marsan a little bit more acidity. The Marsan adds a little bit of heft to the Roussan. And those are the white grapes that you're normally going to find in the Northern Rhone, just the Viognier, Marsan, and the Roussan. The quality pyramid of the AOPs in the Rhone don't mean as much in the Northern Rhone. You get some Cote de Rhone from the Northern Rhone, but very little. 
most of what we're going to see is going to be from the communes. And so that we're, that's what we're going to concentrate on when we're talking about the Northern Rhone. One of the reasons we should think about the Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone as different wine regions is because the Northern Rhone has a completely different climate. In the Northern Rhone, we're dealing with the continental climate. Uh, so we have rain any time of year. We have cooler winters. We have warm summers. We have a big disparity between the temperatures during the different times of year. We also deal with steep slopes in the Northern Rhone. The Southern Rhone, when we talk about that, we're really talking about a flatter terrain. In the Northern Rhone, we have very steep slopes, so steep that some of the vineyards are terraced. We have some areas, such as in the Cote Roti, where the slopes are 55 degrees. Uh, if you think about what 45 degrees is, and then you add another 10% to that, you can imagine trying to harvest grapes or care for vines on 55 degrees. Because of the steep slopes, soil runs down the hillsides. They use pulley systems, not only to help them harvest the grapes, but sometimes to bring the soils from the bottom of the hill back to the north so they could reconstruct uh, the areas where the vines are. So we're dealing with a much different kind of situation in the Northern Rhone than we are in the Southern Rhone. So let's talk about some of the crews of the Northern Rhone. We start with the Cote Roti. Uh, this is the roasted slopes. They're, this is where I talked about where the slopes can be very steep, up to 55 degrees. So some of the vineyards are terraced. These are very hard to work, takes a lot of time. Uh, you have the pulley systems in some of these vineyards. Cote Roti is going to be red and it's almost always going to be just Syrah. It used to be that you had a lot of Viognier in your Cote Roti. 20% Viognier is permitted. And the Viognier was added not only to add this kind of apricot and peach uh, flavor to the wine, but also because it helped stabilize the Syrah color a little bit more. But you don't see as much of the uh, Viognier being used anymore. Uh, some people still do, but if they are going to use it, it's far less than the 20%, if any at all. As we move to the south, we then come to Condru and also Chateau Groulet. This is 100% Viognier. Uh, as we talked about, it tends to be higher alcohol. It has these beautiful, beautiful aromatics. And again, if you smell this wine, you're going to be thinking, well, this is going to be a fruity wine. And it really surprises you because it's very dry. So you're going to smell it, get these beautiful aromatics, taste it, get this very dry wine. And it's, it, they're just very lovely wines. As we move further south, we come to Hermitage. This is one of the most famous wine regions in the world. The quality of the wines from Hermitage have been talked about for centuries. It's on the left bank of the Rhone. You have this huge hill on the river facing to the south. About 70% of the wines that are made in Hermitage are red, 30% white. They allow some Marsan and Roussan in there, but uh, re really you don't get a whole lot. Um, normally you don't pick it up. It's mostly just Syrah. And now we talk about Crow's Hermitage. This is the largest crew in the north. When you're going to get a northern Rhone, a lot of the times it's going to be a either a San Joseph or a, Cro a Croix Hermitage. Produces 91% 90, of the wines from this region are red. Uh, it does allow a little Marsan and Roussan. Uh, some very nice wines come from Croix Hermitage. Uh, unfortunately, the quality really varies. Uh, it's a good price region because you can find, you know, because the quality does vary so much. So it doesn't have the reputation it could have. But you can find some decent gross amortage at a decent price level. It's a good introduction to the region. Uh, same is true also of San Joseph. Uh, most of this, again, is going to be red wine. It does allow some blending of Marsan and Roussan. Like Croix Hermitage, the quality kind of varies. They're working very hard, though. They've been kind of limiting where they've been growing. At one time, they expanded their growing region, and now they're cutting back in order to try to improve the quality of the wines coming out of the region. One of my favorite regions in the Northern Rhone is Cornas. 
This is 100% Syrah. At one time, it was known for what people said were kind of brutal and savage tannins. I always liked that style. I always found that Cornell was the best example of Syrah. It was kind of brutal, but I enjoyed it. You have a lot of people in the region now that not surprisingly have said, hey, Australian style is very popular. Why don't we make some of those? And so you're getting some of these more fruity, fruit bomb styles coming out of Cornell. They're a little different than the Australian because they're getting about 13%, 13.5% alcohol, and the Australian is more commonly 13.5 to 14.5. But otherwise, it's very similar in style. Uh, but personally, I prefer, I prefer the traditional style, uh, but uh, that's probably not selling quite as well as the Australian. And then the final region in the cruise of Northern Rhone is saint Pere, and a lot of you may be thinking I'm not familiar with that, uh, and that's because it's just not seen as much, especially the sparkling wines. But the white wines from saint Pere can be beautiful white wines. They're made from Marsan and Roussan, and the sparkling wines can also be quite lovely. Now we get to the Southern Rhone. And what does it say on the top of the slide? 95% of the Rhone production. And that's what it is. Northern Rhone is, I mean, thanks to Hermitage, it's very well known in the world, but when you're talking about Rhone production, most of it, 95% of it, is coming from the Southern Rhone. And the Southern Rhone has some of the regions that you'll all be familiar with, Chateauneuf de Pop, of course, the Côte de Rhone, Tavel, Gigandas. These are names that you see all over wine shops, and they're very well known. Now, the climate of the Southern Rhone, unlike the climate of the Northern Rhone, here we're talking about Mediterranean climate. And in the Southern Rhone, you come out of the mountains, you got flatter land, you have more influence from the Mediterranean Sea to the south, and you also have the Mistral. And, uh, you know, people talk about the Mistral. Uh, the Mistral is a powerful wind. Uh, it averages about 52 miles an hour sometimes a year. If the vines are not properly staked, it can snap them. You end up having uh, Grenache, which is commonly grown in the Southern Rhone, often done in bush vines close to the ground. When Syrah is grown, they tend to have it double staked, very heavily staked, so that the Syrah is not snapped by the Mistral. So it's a very different kind of thing than we're dealing with in the Northern Rhone. Uh, Grenache is a warm weather grape, and you get that when you're dealing with the Southern Rhone with its Mediterranean climate. We talk about the quality AOPs in the Southern Rhone, and here they actually really do apply, because this is where your Cote de Rhone primarily comes from. This is where you get your Cote de Rhone village, and of course you have your many commune levels in the south as well. The primary grapes we're going to be talking about in the Southern Rhone, uh, unlike the Northern Rhone where Syrah is king and we have a couple whites, the Southern Rhone is really a blending region. I show Grenache here because Grenache is the primary red grape in the Southern Rhone, but really most of the wines that you're going to get from the Southern Rhone are going to be blends. A lot of them are going to be GSMs, which is a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and Morvedre. You also see Cinso and Carillon in the red wines in uh, the Southern Rhone as part of the blend. And, and when it comes to the white wines, you're dealing with the same thing too. It's really a blending region. I have Grenache Blanc here, but you see Bourblanc, you see Claret, you see Marsan, Rousson, you see Viognier, and they're all part of the blend. Uh, so this is really a blending region. Uh, you may on occasion see 100% Grenache or 100% Grenache Blanc, but Southern Rhone primarily, when you think about it, think of it as a blending region. Okay, so let's talk about the AOPs in the Southern Rhone. First one is Cote de Rhone. 
80% of the region's production, and this is 80% of the Rhone production, is Cote de Rhone. The grapes can come from anywhere in the region, including the Northern Rhone, but it's pretty much all from the Southern Rhone. Most of the wines are gonna be your GSMs. You're gonna have your Grenache, you're gonna have your Syrah, you're gonna have your, your Morbedra. You may have some Carillon, you may have some Cinso, you may have some white wine in there too, uh, especially when you're dealing with something like Bourbalenc or Grenache Blanc. Um, if you're gonna be having a white blend, it's gonna be your Grenache Blanc, Rousson, Mersan, Claret, Bourbalenc, and Viognier's. Those are gonna be the primary grapes you're gonna have in there. And some of these wines are excellent. Some of them are average. Can't really ever say that I've had a bad one. But these wines are primarily what you get out of the Southern Rhone. You're gonna get the Cote de Rhone's. And if you're not getting them from the Cote de Rhone, you're gonna get them from the Cote de Rhone Village. And the Village, these are higher quality um, Cote de Rhone wines. They have to have a minimum of 50% Grenache with at least another 20% of Syrah or Mervedra or both. So you end up with heavy GSM style wines. They can have a little carry on in them. They can have a little bit of other grapes. Some of the villages are allowed to append their name. So you might get, you know, Sobre um, or, uh, as a village that's appended its name to the, to the wine. But, you know, sometimes it's just Cote de Rhone village as well. Of the Southern Rhone communes, the one that is probably best known is the Chateauneuf de Pop. And a lot of people look at that and they say, I don't know how to pronounce that. And the nice thing is, is that a lot of people figure that out. And so they said, okay, I'm just going to call it CDP. And if you go to a wine store and you don't know how to pronounce it, or you're a little worried that you can't pronounce it, just tell them you're looking for a CDP. And the chances are they're going to know what you're talking about. The same thing in a restaurant, CDP. Um, everybody tends to call it that. Chateauneuf de Pop is about 94% red wines. It's famous for its Galais soils, and the Galais are these very large rocks, very large stones that are covered all over the ground. And the Galais soils, the stones absorb the heat. So the vines are pruned very low in order to allow the heat to come up from the stones. So the night comes, it gets a little bit cooler, but the stones are still warm, and they help the ripening of the grapes. And Grenache really needs a lot of uh, heat in order to ripen properly. There are 13 permitted varieties in Chateauneuf de Pop, but mostly, mostly you're going to get Grenache and Syrah. Uh, you might get a few wines where they make a point of pride of using all 13 permitted varieties, but most of your wines are going to be Grenache and Syrah with a little bit of Morvedra and Cinso. Uh, Chateauneuf de Pop was the first AOC. When we talk about AOCs or AOPs, I mean, that's a system in order to, that was created in order to ensure quality coming out of these wine regions. And Chateauneuf de Pop was the first one to say, wait a second, we've got some problems with quality here and there. We're going to create this system. And if you want to put Chateauneuf de Pop on the label, you got to jump through all these hoops. And they were the first ones to do that. And then everybody else said, that's a good idea, and followed suit. The next major commune is Gigandas. Um, Gigandas is mostly red. It's mostly GSM. No carry-on is allowed. It does have a very little bit of rosé. I used to call Gigandas Gigundas only because the wines were so big, um, and also because I thought it was kind of funny but uh, Gigandas is the proper pronunciation. Vakura uh, is another GSM region. It is a little bit more tannic, a little bit more savage, but it's making some very good wines out of the three regions that we've talked about. I'm mostly buying Vakura now just because I do like that little bit more savage, less refined characteristic. Tavel is exclusively rosé. 
and the Sanye method is typical. Now, Sanye is a method to make rosé wines, and it was originally created because somebody, some people wanted to make a red wine. They really wanted to have a lot of skin contact, and what they would do is they'd bleed the tank after uh, a day or so, or sometimes just several hours in order to get some of the juice out so that you had a lower juice skin ratio with what was left in the tank. That could give you a very deep, powerful red wine. And what they ended up doing with, with this juice that they bled out, they said, you know, this is like a light rosé, we'll sell that or we'll drink that ourselves. And it began selling very well. So they started using that to make some rosé while they were also making red wines. In Tavel, they don't make the red wines. The Sanye is solely for purposes of making their rosés. Uh, the Sanye, the rosés in Tavel are mostly Grenache with a little bit of Cinceau. Um, these are some fantastic rosés. Next is Lara, and Lara, like Tavel, makes some spectacular rosés. You can find some Lara rosés in the United States. Uh, you can see though that they also make red wines. So when they do Sanye, they may be trying to build up their reds as well as making rosés. Uh, Carrion is not allowed more than 10% in Lara. And, and this is a good time to talk about Carrion. Uh, Carrion is a great grape in the right regions. If you're very careful with your yields on it, it can make a very good wine. They make great wines with it in the Priorat in, in Spain. In, if you let the yields go crazy, and that's actually why Carrion was originally planted in the southern France, is because it yields very well, it doesn't make a very good wine. So there are a lot of rules in the southern Rhone about how much Carrion can be utilized, and that's because sometimes the yields are allowed to go rampant. Uh, but the uh, So that's why you have the limitations on some of these regions, in case you were thinking, why are they having these specific limitations for carry on? It's, it's because sometimes when the yields go rampant, it just ends up getting a bitter tannins and not a very good wine. But when it is properly made, a carry on wine can be, can be wonderful. Uh, next we talk about Vin Sobre, uh, reds only. It's going to be GSMs. Uh, Bombe de Venise, they make some red wines. Uh, I have not seen any in the United States, but they make some red wines. The primary thing you're going to see here is going to be these fortified wines from Muscat. 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol, uh, beautiful aromatics. They're lovely wines, a little on the sweet side, very on the sweet side, not like a sauterne, but a sweet wines, fortified whites, beautiful aromatics, nice wines, very nice wines. And then we have Resto. Uh, it got crew status in 2010, uh, really dealing with the Rhone style reds, whites, and rosés. Make some good wines. Uh, not as common on the market as some of the other regions, but if you can find a resto, you know, they're, they're worth giving a shot. So thank you very much. I, I hope you found this informative. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at directoreducation at AmericanWineSociety.org. You can also leave a message down below. I actually do respond. Thank you very much.